Ms. Tikhanovskaya, welcome to Voice of America's News Center. Welcome to Washington, D.C. Glad to see you. There is a lot of ground I want to cover with you today, and I know you have a lot of news to tell to us and our audiences, so let's get straight to it. Uh, you, I know you came to Washington this time to take part in this initiative called the Strategic Dialogue. Can you tell us more about it? So Strategic Dialogue is a new level of relationship between official USA and Democratic Forces of Belarus. It's like new level uh, because it's uh, I hope that after uh, beginning of the strategic dialogue, new working groups between uh, U.S. government and uh, Belarusian Democratic Forces will be launched on different topics. We need a consistent focus on uh, such problems as political prisoners in our country, th threat to our independence, to uh, accountability of uh, those representatives of the regime who committed crimes against people who became complicit in the war and abduction of Ukrainian children. So it needs constant discussion because Belarus plays a crucial role in uh, our regional crisis. Belarus is part of this crisis, and this crisis should be solved in complex. And of course, one important issue is uh, commitment to the future of Belarus, because we all understand that sooner or later there will be negotiations between Russia and Ukraine uh, because of this war, and Belarus should be part of this. You know, Belarus shouldn't be given as consolation prize for Putin during these negotiations, and representatives of Belarusian Democratic Forces should be at the uh, um, table of negotiations. Mm -hmm. Who initiated this dialogue? Was it the State Department, or did it come from your team? Uh, it was declared by Secretary Blinken uh, in March uh, this year, but uh, of course it discussed before with the embassy in uh, Lithuania, and uh, I think it's a uh, good uh, level of relationship for both of our side, bo both of sides. This past September, Lukashenko has uh, issued a decree basically banning the Belarusian embassies to issue passports overseas uh, to Belarusian uh, citizens. Why do you think he has done that? Uh, of course, it's revenge on all those people who are opposing the regime and uh, he can't reach them because they live at the moment in peaceful countries, but they're not giving up their fight against Lukashenko's regime. So that's why he wants to make uh, life more difficult for uh, people. And of course, it's a huge challenge for us because persons can't uh, live uh, illegally in different countries, but when mm -hmm. you can't renew your passports, you can't register your newborn children or you can't get any documents. So it's, it's uh, rather difficult. So that's why we are working, of course, on this issue with our democratic partners, and we are proposing a short-term solution to this issue and long-term solution. As a short-term solution, we are asking to give uh, passports of foreigners to Be Belarusian people, and uh, here in the USA to provide temporary protection status to Belarusians because of this extraordinary uh, situation. But what is more important for us is to issue uh, our own passports, passports of new Belarus to uh, Belarusians, it's rather unprecedented issue. Uh, nobody have done this before, but uh, it will be the more systematic approach. I think you used the most appropriate and apt word in this case, uh, unprecedented. Um, let's talk a little bit more about this in detail. I'm really curious. Like, so who will be the issuing authority in this case of those passports? Uh, it will be United Traditional Cabinet that was launched uh, last year uh, yes, as proto-government of democratic forces. Mm -hmm. And where will the passports be printed? It like will be printed uh, by an uh, official body in uh, Lithuania. It's a body that issues a lot of passports for many European countries. So it's not just we invented something and decided to, pre mm -hmm. to print it ourselves. Of course, we are working in uh, constant uh, communication with the European Commission. We have to provide that our passport correspond to all the security uh, you know, uh, demands, uh, mm -hmm. international demands. Uh, and uh, just, uh, you know, so as we will seek for recognition of this passport, this passport should coincide all, all the necessary uh, requirements. Mm -hmm. And when are you expecting to issue the first badge of passports? So the first specimens uh, supposedly will be produced at the beginning of the next year. We'll send the specimens to Brussels for them to evaluate it and to send to um, capitals of different countries for them uh, to see if, uh, you know, what can be done for, to recognize. Mm -hmm. That would be my next, actually, uh, question to you. Do you have, were you in discussions with the U.S. government, with the EU, 
uh, with other countries, governments, w like, will they be accepting those passports and what would be the standard for that? Uh, actually, this project is percepted now as rather cautiously because mm -hmm. nobody has done this before and everything new is scaring, uh, usually. And uh, we haven't heard any negative uh, feedback on this project, but uh, of course, uh, you know, people have to take this into hands, you know, to look into this, to send it to uh, ministries, uh, Minister of Justice, for example, you know, uh, to Internal Affairs Ministry for them to evaluate the possibility of recognition. But, uh, you know, I know that it's, it's necessary for us, so that's why we will insist, we will explain why it's necessary to do, we will give pros and cons of, of uh, this, but, uh, you know, I understand some fear about this project, but uh, I'm so sure that non-conventional times need non-conventional decisions. And it's necessary to show dictators they, they can't own people. You know, we, they can't make people return home and detain them, but to give opportunity to people to be inventive, to be creative, just support us. And the last question on passports, I know there was some controversy um, regarding what to actually call it. Is it like just an ID card? Is it a travel permit? Or is it a full-fledged national alternative Belarusian passport? What are they? Uh, it's a good question because I think the passport can play a different role. Uh, for sure, it's an ident identification document. It will be given uh, on the basis of your old passport, but uh, for sure you will, you will need necessary visas, you know, to, to travel. And, uh, but it will be like a document for, for you to have possibility to, uh, uh, you know, to, to, to take, to have residence permits in different countries, to have visas. So it will be no document from nowhere. Mm -hmm. Let's move on. Uh, you call Moscow's actions and dominance in Belarus uh, cultural and identity genocide towards the Belarusian yeah. people. Um, can you please elaborate? What do you mean by that? What's happening in Belarus now with the allowance of illegitimate uh, Lukashenko is a uh, silent war because it's uh, not visible from abroad. You know, nobody like pay attention that uh, there is a process of full Russification in mm -hmm. Belarus. They ruin everything Belarusian, our Belarusian history. Uh, they take uh, our joint Belarusian European heroes, monuments from museums and put Russian instead. They uh, change uh, um, road signs uh, from Belarusian language to Russian. We see how Russia influenced uh, Belarusian media, they influence Belarusian uh, education, of course they present, they present in military sphere, in, uh, uh, in uh, economic sphere. Mm -hmm. So it's like creeping occupation of our country and it uh, goes on with the, without any like attention from, from uh, democratic countries. It's really we are at uh, our independence is at stake in the moment and we need powerful countries who will help us to protect it. Well, why, why do you think Lukashenko is allowing this to ca happen? Because it looks like he might l completely lose, uh, you know, autonomy uh, in this case. And, you know, if things go south, he can be easily replaced by Moscow, no? Uh, Lukashenko has never uh, valued uh, everything Belarusians. He never mm -hmm. spoke Belarusian language. He, uh, when he came to power, he changed our national symbols mm -hmm. to pro-Soviet uh, ones. And he's the most pro-Soviet Union person or pro-Russian pro uh, person in, in uh, Belarus. He's ready to sacrifice um, uh, our sovereignty in exchange to stay in power. And moreover, I suppose that uh, uh, he's dreaming uh, to be Mm, uh, like president of the whole Russian empire to replace maybe Putin himself. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, last June, uh, Mr. Lukashenko became a global celebrity by brokering that proverbial peace deal between Vladimir Putin and uh, Evgeny Prigozhin, the head of Wagner Group. Um, he basically promised him his personal security guarantees, putting his personal reputation on the line. Two months later, Mr. Pogosian was dead. He was killed in an air crash, as you know. Uh, do you think, what is your, first of all, what is your interpretation of what happened then? Uh, at this situation, Lukashenko was just a postman. 
uh, between uh, Prigozhin and Putin, and for sure he couldn't himself decide uh, how to give guarantees to, to Prigozhin. Mm -hmm. He was he just fulfilled the will of Putin in that situation. Of course, he gained some political scores in that situation. He looked like a hero at that moment, uh, but for sure he was just doing what he has done, uh, or what he was said to do. And uh, of course, we see that his words uh, means nothing. He couldn't give any guarantees to Prigozhin. But uh, I, know, I think that the situation with the Wagner uh, uh, is percepted differently by Putin and, and Lukashenko because Putin wants this like trademark to disappear because it was like cumulative history for him. But for Lukashenko, he wants to save this, this trademark because it's uh, opportunity to blackmail or to threaten Belarusians or to threaten and neighbors, but uh, as far as I know, it's only up to 500 Wagners are still in our country. There is some the technique equipment uh, mm. in uh, in this camp, but uh, you know most of people left our country. Do you think Lukashenko knew what would happen to Prigozhin, or Putin gave him guarantees? Really, he was being sincere, and Putin given, gave him guarantees that uh, he will not touch him. I don't think that dictators can be sincere at all. In your meetings with uh, foreign uh, leaders, you invariably bring up the dire situation ag uh, around the political prisoners in Belarus. And, and we spoke about this before. Uh, this topic is particularly close to your heart because <coughs> your husband is, has been in jail for three and a half years now, and uh, he's been sentenced to 19 years, mm -hmm. as far as I understand. Um, I know that you haven't been uh, in touch with him. You were not allowed to be in touch with him for uh, since last March, I believe. Yeah. And then this past summer, you received a rather strange message uh, from an anonymous uh, call caller. Um, can you please tell us what, what happened then? Uh. You know, time to time, regime uh, sent such uh, information that uh, political prisoners uh, like dying in prison, and uh, uh, information appeared that my husband was uh, uh, committed committed suicide uh, in uh, in the prison. And of course, you know, it's when you can't check it, of course, you think it's truth. And immediately, uh, Belarusian people and international society started to demand. You know, from uh, from this regime to show Sergei Tikhanovsky to to the world to to his wife, and uh, I don't know what influenced this regime, maybe this extra attention, but they showed us uh, uh, several shots from prison where I saw a person who looked like my husband, but I hardly could recognize him because he looked absolutely differently. And I need to uh, watch this uh, video several times before I uh, agreed that this is my husband. So, um, but since then, uh, so many months passed and Louis is not allowed to visit my husband. And uh, I don't know what, what's, hap what's going on with him uh, at the moment. But uh, you know, it's many people uh, are kept in, in Kanmakedo mode in Belarus. It means that uh, lawyers are not allowed, letters are not delivered, relatives who are still in Belarus can't visit um, uh, their beloved. So uh, it's a type of torturing, actually, and uh, it's done to break people inside prisons, to um, show them that they are abandoned, forgotten, nobody's taking care of them. Uh, and um, I, uh, of course, it's a huge burden on the shoulders of relatives as well, because when you don't know what's happening with your, with your beloved, like Nobel Peace Prize winner Alias Belyatsky in the same situation. Mm -hmm. So when you requested some information on your husband, they did send you those screenshots? That's what no, ended up No, it was like it was published uh, in, in media. In the media. Yeah. So you never got a, an official response no. from the authorities? No as to what is happening? No, I, never, I, I, I didn't apply for, for, uh, for this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You, never, you never requested any information? No, no. So. Uh, this, uh, we, I have, uh, my husband has lawyer in Belarus, and uh, this is his job, you know, to mm -hmm. defend uh, my husband. I can do it publicly, what I did, mm -hmm. and they showed it publicly, but uh, lawyer himself can't uh, reach my husband. Uh, who do you think was behind that text message? Why, what, what was their goal? Uh, I think it's to, I don't know, just to feel extra pain for to myself, I don't to break me. To make you, you know, suffer. Yeah, yeah, to make me suffer. Uh, because of course when you can't check, it's like you can't work, 
at this moment. You know, you, 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 you have to use your time to uh, check information if this is true or not. So it's awful feeling. Uh, the Yale University researchers say that there, were, uh, there was an industrial, and I quote, scale pipeline of child deportation from parts of Ukraine now occupied by Russia, and that Lukashenko uh, participated in it. Apparently, or allegedly, we should say, almost 2,500 kids were deported from eastern Ukraine to Belarus. And Lukashenko essentially was helping Putin with this. Mm -hmm. uh, why do you think he went ahead with that? Because he... He's not a stupid guy. He understands that it's a very, very serious crime. Uh, I think that uh, Lukashenko can't uh, make any decisions himself. At the moment, he's puppet of Kremlin, and he's fulfilling what he's said uh, to do. So, or maybe he wanted to show extra loyalty mm -hmm. uh, to Putin. It uh, also can be argument. So, yeah, we have proofs uh, uh, that more than 2,000 children have been abducted to Belarus, and we have to use this um, to launch special investigation on this crime. You know, it's a pity that uh, for three years we are trying to drag Lukashenko to accountability for crimes against Belarusian people, for tortures, for uh, migration crisis, for hijacking airplane. And uh, it's pity to see undecisiveness in judicial, international judicial system. And I hope that uh, this proves, and this is what uh, Putin and Vova Belova were brought to accountability, will help us to start investigation against Lukashenko's crimes as well. You, you said to me just now that you, uh, you have have some proof yeah. of this. You you received some documents or yeah. what, what what kind of? Can you explain, uh, my, please? My representative uh, on sanctions, Pavel Latushka, you know, he gathered uh, tons of documents uh, regarding the abduction of Ukrainian children, and we actually delivered these documents to ICC to Karim Khan. And uh, when we get extra uh, documents, we send it uh, again. So. Uh, you know, all the papers is on the table. And, and where did those documents come from? What is the source? From, uh, from internal sources. Uh, you know, it looks like nothing is happening in Belarus because, you know, you don't see beautiful big rallies, but uh, so many supporters of democratic changes inside the country and also inside the system that people who are working in different ministry in uh, the close to Lukashenko, they providing us with, uh, with uh, um, uh, inside information. Mm -hmm. This is leakage. Mm -hmm. Uh, you requested, you asked the U.S. government to appoint a uh, special envoy to Belarus. What should be his responsibilities, you think? Um, when, back in 2021, the first special envoy was appointed by the USA, it was Julia Fischer. She opened so many doors for us here in the State Department and the USA. We managed, uh, uh, thanks to her help, to reopen Belarus for, for uh, this wonderful democratic country. Uh, special envoy is like a bridge between democratic forces and the USA for here uh, to keep a focus on our country, to be updated uh, on the changing of the situation, to be updated on the, uh, our activities, what we are doing, what may be urgent assistance we need, what uh, next steps we, need, we, we, we want from uh, the USA. So it's like constant uh, wire, you know, between us and, and they say. So it, uh, uh, this person can uh, play a huge and powerful role, first of all, for us. A lot of your former colleagues who fought for you during those protests, fought with you, alongside you, uh, they're now in jail. Uh, have you ever thought of what would have happened to you had you not left Belarus that day with two of your little kids? I think that uh, I would be among those who are in prison. So I would be beside Maria Kolesnikova and uh, women, female journalists and activists. And uh, it's really... Mm, you know, a very difficult uh, question for every person who is leaving country to leave or to stay. Mm -hmm. Because you understand that, you know, it, it's, you, you should be in Belarus, it's your country, you are defending it, but if you're in jail, you can't do anything at all. You will be silenced. But when you uh, in exile, yes, you, like, as if mm, you betrayed 
you know, your fight because you're not inside, but you can do a lot. You can keep builders on agenda. You can attract uh, attention. You can attract assistance. You can strengthen uh, national identity and civil society. You can unite, actually. So uh, it's a big question. But at that moment, I made this choice. Uh, do I feel pity time to time? Yes, I do. But uh, again, understand that you are voiceless in prisons. So. It's, you know, difficult. <laughs> I understand. Would you have made that choice again? Uh, maybe if I was better prepared for this conversation with the KGB back in, uh, in uh, August 2020, maybe I would stay, maybe. Knowing that you would have been put in jail? Maybe, yeah. You know, we, we still, you know, looking back, I see that we still had some, um, some time, you know, before Masha Kolesnikova was detained. It was a couple of weeks and a huge rally started. So maybe I would be detained immediately and couldn't see uh, all of this. Mm. Please don't torture me. <laughs> I won't. Uh, what gives you hope? What keeps you, again, going? What's uh, the light of the day for you? You know, my uh, personal fight is not about hope, because you can't uh, uh, like live only with hope. Just we can hope that Ukraine will win. Mm -hmm. We can hope that something will change in Russia. That will change uh, everything in Belarus. Uh, our fight is everyday hard job. You know, helping people, uh, uniting people, uh, supporting in initiatives, attracting attention to Belarus. You just you don't leave. You fight every day, and uh, hope became aims. Hope became tasks, everyday tasks, uh, and of course, I, I just know that I will return back to Belarus. That Belarusian people will be released from prisons, but how long it will take, I don't know. But you can't. Uh, you know that you can't give up. You every morning wake up with thoughts about political prisoners, about your country. Go to bed with the, with the same thoughts. So. Uh, that's why it's, you know, Ukrainians now, they don't also are not hoping. They are fighting, fighting on the battlefields. In Belarus, people fighting undergroundly. They're sacrificing their lives, their time, you know, to, to continue. So uh, hope is good, but hard work is necessary. Some practical steps need Absolutely. to be taken. That's what you say. Yeah. Silana Tikhanovskaya, thank you for this interview to Voice of America's News Center. My pleasure.